so this is the second ever one HP general club. Um, this particular one is really focusing on our mobile gaming population, or at least in most likelihood, uh, the results of this are going to be exceptionally applicable to our mobile gamers, as well as to literally anybody who uses a phone on a regular basis. Insert Diablo meme here. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Elliot, uh, this was an article that you reviewed. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the overall study design. What was What were their goals? Yeah, for sure. So the goals of this study uh, were to look at uh, changes in the neck and trunk postures in smartphone users. Also, they wanted to examine changes in the EMG activation of specific muscle groups. So they were looking at the electrical activity of different muscles in these postures that these users were assuming during this time period. Uh, the muscles that they specifically looked at were the cervical erector spinae muscles. So those are the muscles that extend your neck the upper trapezius muscles, and those are muscles that are on top of your shoulders, and uh, they oftentimes get very tight uh, with a lot of kind of forward head uh, gaming and um, mobile uh, use. So they also looked at the lower trapezius muscles, uh, which are muscles in the lower or upper, upper mid-back area, and the thoracic extensor spinae muscles, and those are muscles that extend your mid-back. Uh, and then the last thing they wanted to look at were the pain levels that are induced by 16 minutes of playing the smartphone game. Right. So this was like a kind of short period of time for those of us who have a small addiction to mobile games. <laughs> cough, cough. Um, <laughs> it's also a kind of short period of time for like anybody who actually competes at mobile gaming. Um, so this is this is probably going to be something that that's going to give us some some basic upfront data, um, even if it isn't necessarily looking at the full duration of time that they'd be playing. Uh, so what kind of study would this be considered? So this study classifies as an analytic observational cross-sectional study, which is... That's a lot of words. Enough. That's a lot of words. Bring it down. Uh, so the analytic component, because uh, the study quantifies the relationship between two factors, and the factors that they're quantifying are the effect of an intervention uh, on an outcome. So to quantify the effect, they need to know if the rate of outcomes in the comparison group, as well as the intervention or exposed group. So the analytic uh, component of the study comes from the fact that they are quantifying the relationship between two factors. And the two factors that they are quantifying here are the effects of an intervention or exposure on an outcome. And to quantify the effect, we need to know the rate of outcomes in a comparison group, as well as the intervention or exposure group. So whether the research or actively changes a factor or imposes uses or imposes an intervention determines whether the study is observational, which is a passive involvement of the researcher or an experimental, which is the active involvement of the researcher. Um, and if the outcomes were determined at the same time as the exposure or intervention, it is classified as a cross-sectional study or survey. Okay, so if this had been like, you know, the researcher repeatedly poking them in the back of the neck, that would have been uh, experimental. The yes. researchers are back just staring at them, which makes it observational. That is um, correct. Don't, don't poke your research subjects unless absolutely necessary. Uh, so how did they choose who was going to be involved in this particular study? What was the inclusion? What was the exclusion criteria? So the inclusion criteria for the study was the participants had to be right-hand dominant, they had to own a smartphone, and be familiar with the AnyPeng game, which is kind of a game like uh, Candy Crush, where you're flipping tiles and making lines. Um, so the exclusion criteria for the study was uh, the, the participants had to be free of any congenital deformities. They also had to not have any musculoskeletal conditions before the uh, study. They had to be free of neurological conditions and free of pain in their upper extremities and spine structures. I kind of like that. So this was looking at a, a specifically pain-free population um, that based on their lack of previous um, underlying issue would probably be at lower risk for pain over, or for at lower risk of injury overall. Um, so this is great for looking at our healthy subjects, which most of us are. Good job, people. Um, how did they recruit these folks? All right. So they recruited um, through a uh, university um, and they had uh, participants volunteer for the study. So total, they had 18 male college students um, volunteer and the average duration of smartphone use for the subjects was 
3.93, uh, give or take about uh, 0.68 hours a day. So about four hours a day of smartphone use. And the average BMI was in a normal range and that was 21.5 uh, approximately. Um, so they sound like, like exceptionally normal people. Wonderful. Yes, exceptionally normal people if you're looking at gamers, yes. Yes, yes. Um, because it is unfortunately true that um, we have an, a disproportionate representation of dudes around here, trying to stick up to the ladies here. But I mean, honestly, I, I think I think I do want to see, uh, jumping on a side note of the study, I do want to see more studies that include both male and female participants when it looks at gaming stuff like this, because at this point we've got enough female gamers um, and enough you know, non-binary non -binary competitors that we're really not getting the most out of our data if we're not looking at all of the populations it's going to apply to, um, or at least as many populations as is reasonably feasible. Back right. off my especially, especially in mobile gaming, there are a lot oh, more sure. females represented yeah. in that population, but this study did give a specific reason as to why they did not include females. It was because of the cultural uh, norms in South Korea and the fact that uh, females do not consent to have photographs taken without uh, covering. Ah, oh, all right. Um, well, hey, people can choose what they want to choose about having their photographs taken, which was important for this study to note because one of the things they did was they took photographs of posture. Um, did Was there anything done in terms of trying to limit bias overall? So there was no blinding discussed in this study. It would be kind of hard to be blinded to the people you are observing, um, which right. I think we talked about last time. That's one of the hard parts about PT interventions is that it's kind of hard. It's really hard to double blind them, and it's even kind of hard to single blind them. Especially in an observational uh, study where the whole point is to where the whole point is observe, to yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a, a blinded observational study is, is going to be a little bit difficult when it comes to physical therapy stuff in particular. Um, did any patients drop out during the study? Uh, no, there was no attrition reported. Wonderful. They all stuck around. It didn't take them very long. It was like 16 minutes. Um, yeah, that's so, some commitment issues if you can't stick around for the 15 minutes. I mean, you might just get like really mad at the game and rage quit or something, but in that case, you probably weren't uh, I, a great candidate for the study in the first place. Um, so how did they how did they assess um, kind of those those objectives that they were looking at? What Did they use any specific tests or so they did actually, they looked at the visual analog scale to determine uh, the postures of the neck and back. They also used electromyography, which we talked about earlier that uh, measures the electrical impulses of contracting muscles. And they also used um, goniometric measurements uh, using a virtual goniometer. Ooh, wait, I really want a virtual goniometer. Did I say that again? Go ahead. It's, it's super, super neat. I would I would really like a virtual goniometer. That sounds great. Um, Santa, if you're listening, for Christmas, please. Um, so how did they analyze their data? So one-way repeated measures ANOVA was used to compare the neck and trunk angles over time because that's what an ANOVA does. It looks at various factors and how they change over a given period of time. For EMG amplitudes, it was also analyzed using a one-way ANOVA, and that makes sense because it's changed over time. And a paired t-test was performed to analyze the cervical and thoracic visual analog scale scores for pain. Um, and the paired t-test there was used to compare two population means where you have two samples in which observations in one sample can be paired with observations in the other sample. So kind of like a before and after uh, kind of comparison there. That makes sense. All right, so now we've established that they had at least some reasonable amount of an idea of what they were doing when it came to how they structured their study design. Um, and it entirely makes sense why they made the decisions that they did. So let's find out what they find out. Um, what did they find when it came to, let's start with what, when it came to pain, because I know that's going to be something that a lot of people are interested in. Pain. It increased. Not by a crazy <laughs> amount, but a marginal amount. And we got to remember that this is over 16 minutes. So it makes a lot of sense why people that are on their phones for a long period of time experiencing significant pain when it went up by two to four points after 16 minutes. Right. And to be clear, like a, a visual analog scale like this would mean that you're basically rating your, your pain on a scale of zero to 10. And so they're saying they, they went from like a zero to a two or a four or like a four to a six. 
So definite increases enough that we should pay attention to them, and that's with only 16 minutes of playing. What did they find about the posture of their... So the flexion of both the neck and trunk of the subjects at 5 minutes, 10 minutes, and 15 minutes of the gaming experience was significantly greater uh, than at the beginning. So they found it increased. So they rounded over time. They got into that like kind of hunched, stereotypical gamer posture. Yes. Yes, indeed. All right. And what did the EMG stuff find? I love EMG. Okay. So this was the really interesting part to me. Uh, so the bilateral cervical erector spinae muscle group, um, and that's the extensors of the neck, uh, it increased significantly as the amount of smartphone usage increased. Um, and the bilateral low trap and thoracic extent erector spinae muscle groups, um, and that's the muscles in the mid back that are ex uh, responsible for extending the mid back, they actually decreased from the EMG amplitudes at the start of the experiment. And there was no statistically significant difference found in the upper trap EMG amplitudes among the four measurement times. So it didn't change at all. Um, and I, I feel like this is really interesting for reasons that uh, we're going to discuss in a bit. Yeah, let's chat a little bit, though, about um, kind of just what what it would look like if um, somebody was having kind of increased activation in one part, decreased activation in another part. What does that tell us about what their posture is likely? Okay, so we'll talk about that. So the upper cross syndrome, as described by uh, Dr. Janda, um, really looks at these postural syndromes as they relate to activation and inhibition of different muscle groups. So he described this postural syndrome where the chest is essentially tight, the upper back is, uh, is inhibited, uh, the neck flexors are inhibited, and the upper trap and uh, erector spinae of the neck are facilitated. So it kind of creates this cross pattern, and I lovingly refer to it in our circle as nerd neck. Um, and you kind of see this uh, pattern develop across a lot of different play styles, whether it be console, PC, mobile, uh, you kind of all fall into this like screen slouch uh, posture. And what we see here is some scientific data to really back up why these muscles are, um, are, are forming these postures in the, uh, the regions that are described here. Uh, you have the inhibition of the uh, the upper back muscles. Uh, you have the 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 facilitation of the upper trap muscles in the, that they didn't change uh, surround in relation to the other muscles that are surrounding them. Um, the upper cervical muscles uh, associated with that uh, subcranial extension um, are being facilitated. So it's causing a lot of these problems in this rounded shoulder forward head posture. Okay, so. I can definitely, it definitely looking at the EMG data, it makes sense too, right? If you're, if you're kind of sinking into that rounded back posture, well, obviously the muscles that extend the back itself aren't doing quite as much work. They are kind of turned off when you're getting rounder. Um, the, and if you're getting rounder, then you need to lift your head up in order to actually still be able to see the screen well, which means that the muscles of your neck are going to be kicking in more as they kind of lift up to compensate for what your back muscles aren't doing. Uh, and I'm really, I was really interested to see that the lower, the upper trap muscles um, didn't change with regards to their activation. Because I know we we think a lot of, you know, as as people get stressed and more tired and more fatigued, that their shoulders start to come up towards their ears. But what it's looking like is that it's not so much that the upper trap is, is actively bringing the shoulders up, so much as between the the decreased work that the back muscles are doing and the increased work that the neck muscles are doing, we're ending up with the shoulders closer to the ears because the neck moves closer, not because the shoulders move up. Right, I, the result is the same. Was, yeah, the effect is the same, but the cause is different. And I really liked learning that. I thought, I thought that was really helpful to learn from this. Yeah, uh, for sure. So, um, barring my, my little posture and ergonomics geekery there, um, did they manage to answer the study question slash the objectives that they set for this particular study? Yeah, I think they uh, surmised pretty pretty succinctly what they, they set out to look at. Um, I think that we got some really good good information here and a little bit of insight as to why some of the uh, the postural instabilities that we just described are occurring. Um, so it sounds like their conclusions were justified. It sounds like their calculation of, of data analysis methods were sound. Um, do we think that these results are generalizable to a broader population than just this small group of 
And by a small group of young men, I mean specifically the dudes in the study. Yes. Uh, well, I think that we can generalize it to the esports populations, especially um, competitive gamers. Uh, I do believe that we need more information on female populations if we are going to truly generalize it to uh, all of the population that is involved with mobile gaming um, and older populations as well. Mobile gaming is widely pro popular from everyone from your five-year-old nephew to your grandmother. Um, so I really think that you might see some differences in how those populations respond uh, to this type of stress from a mobile device um, just due to changes in uh, ligamentous integrity, uh, hormonal changes that take place with uh, variations in gender and um, age-related considerations. Yeah, I think that's really, really key that um, it, this is definitely generalizable to young male populations and it's probably even at least somewhat generalizable to, to populations outside of that. Um, but there are probably going to be some, some considerations to take into account when it comes to our women in gaming and when it comes to older adult populations. Right, because you've got you know age-related degenerative changes of the neck and back. That's going to alter how muscles act and interact with the spine. Um, you might have a, a difference between um, general, like base, uh, baseline strength measures versus baseline endurance measures between um, age-related populations and between genders. Um, and I, I would really love to see something looking at. Um, are there interventions we can do that would decrease kind of the, the nerd neck, as you call it, occurring, or to kind of prolong the amount of time it takes before getting to nerd neck? And it might be something like, um, it might be as simple as setting a periodic reminder to take breaks or a periodic reminder to recheck posture, or it might be an exercise and strengthening program, which this is, as I'm talking about it, this is totally something we could do. All of those things. Ellie, you want, to, you, want to make, you want to make a study with me? Sure. All right, cool. We're going to make an interventional study based off of this one. Uh, you heard it here first, folks. Um, we did talk a little bit about those upper and lower cross patterns, which is a really great um, clinical significance to this particular study. Um, what, what, can, what, what can kind of clinicians who aren't necessarily familiar with gaming what can they take with this? Take from this that is immediately useful to their gaming populations. So I really think that just discussing with people that are playing games the time frame that they're playing. Um, a lot of clinicians are unfamiliar with the actual loads associated with competitive gaming, especially. You see a lot of streamers that are now playing on mobile, and you're seeing these mobile players incorporated into some of these higher level tournaments now uh, in titles like Fortnite and stuff. Uh, but like the Fortnite Friday and um, uh, Ducky the Gamer, I know, was recently involved with that. Uh, so they they do, we are seeing a lot of um, prolonged competitive playing um, across these platforms. And I think it's really important that the clinicians understand that this isn't just a casual, casual uh, couple hour type of activity throughout the day, that they're really dealing with these long term and need to be looking at the effects that these postures can have on the musculoskeletal structures uh, involved. Yeah, I was um, I actually had a chance to, to chat with Ducky when I was done working with Complexity. Um, and I was really impressed by his and a number of the other mobile gaming players on Complexity, kind of their awareness of like, we know the postures that we're in aren't ideal, but we don't know how to be in postures that aren't these ones and still have really good control of what we're doing. Um, which That I, could be I, some I, really I, interesting. I appreciated their awareness. Honestly, I think, I wonder if the ideal posture for mobile gaming isn't, you know, that like super old picture floating around of a land party where somebody's duct taped the pipe on the ceiling. <laughs> huh, I was about to say something like that. I feel like, like that, that might actually be optimal mobile gaming posture. <laughs> That's such a classic <laughs> photo. But you know what's pretty interesting too about that, and and this is one question I had for sort of how they how they assess and observe. Were they standing or were they sitting? Ah, they were seated. The next thing that I wanted to ask uh, okay. you to talk about there, Elliot, okay. what I, I thought was one of the, the limitations of this study. Describe that exactly. posture that they had. So uh, the authors themselves described this limitation of their study where all of the uh, participants in the study were seated in a chair, kind of like a 90-90 kind of angle, 90 degree bend at the hips, 90 degree bend at the knees, 
an ankle flexion with their feet flat on the ground. So um, all of them were assessed in this posture, regardless of how they normally uh, sit when they play. And obviously when people are playing mobile games, they are not in this specific posture all the time. There's a lot of variability with what happens uh, with mobile gaming. Um, and I really think that is important to take into consideration. And it's a good call on the author's part by uh, describing that as a limitation. Yeah. Yeah, I really did appreciate that they recognized that. I mean, I feel like what's really interesting too is because I've assessed quite a few mobile gamers in terms of their posture and their behavior around how they play, and this is it's pretty standard for them to always change positions, right? So even though this study they assessed, hey, after 60 minutes their VAS went up, most of the time the professionals will have already changed positions, probably as a natural as a natural response to, hey, I feel a little uncomfortable in this position. I'm just going to change. So what I've noticed is that, hey, yeah, I like sitting in my chair. Sometimes I, I lean back. Sometimes I just get on my bed and I lie on my stomach. And what might be optimal for mobile gaming is something that's not static at all and just say, hey, yeah. you guys have this environment where you have a chair, a futon, right, or whatever, and you guys can sit and move around however much you want because you guys are used to that right and there's the downtime in mobile games right instead of forcing them into this really static posture of all right you have to play in front of the stand because that's the standardized thing but you know what's optimal to them one person who's shorter might not be optimal to another that's a lot taller so that's one thing i was thinking a lot about when you guys were just mentioning uh, you know, they're, they're yeah, I think them. that's I think that's something that actually tournament organizers and and teams could take from this study. I mean, this it's not the typical population that's going to be reading this kind of article, but I think that'd be something really valuable for tournament organizers to consider. We you know we we put the the mobile device, be it a tablet, be it a phone, on a stand or a platform because well, that's kind of the closest we get to having a console screen or a computer screen or a TV screen up in front of people. But just because that's how we've done it for other systems doesn't mean that's how we have to do it here. In fact, it probably makes more sense to not do it that way. And certainly it's going to make more health benefits in the long run. It's going to, it's going to result in players being able to play longer and it's probably going to result in players being able to play better. Uh, because if you're stuck in that one position where you're getting stiff and tight, you know, you're going to get breakdown over time. You're going to get inflammation. You're going to get tight. You're going to get tired. You're going to get sore. You're going to end up focusing all of your attention on trying to deal with the fact that you're sore and not enough attention on, like, strategy or tactics. Uh, so I, I would really love to see not only clinicians getting some value out of this, but teams and tournament organizers kind of looking at, at mobile gaming in a bit of a different perspective not just saying, well, we're going to do it this way because this is what looks closest to all the other stuff we've always done, but like, fuck it, bold new world, do something different, figure out what works for you guys. Exactly, it's mobile gaming for multiple Make it mobile. Yep, exactly, you're mobile. You're moving. Mobile gaming, your next posture is your best posture. <laughs> your next posture is your best posture. <laughs> yeah, I really like that. That was, um, yeah, that's great. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to look at further with this particular study, Elliot? Um, I had some other stuff in here, but I think we hit most of the the salient points. Yeah, it sounds like we were both on board with let's totally do our own study. Um, yeah. Now it sounds like we're going to do two studies, one of letting them change their posture and one of interventions after letting them change their posture. We are um, going to do all of the studies. Do let all the studies. I mean, what about... The that is, like, the, you know, like the, the follow-up to that, like, comic, you know, like, they do all the studies, except this one is, like, write all the studies? Write all the Yeah, them. yeah, yeah, that's that's where I usually uh, find myself. I'm really, okay. really excited to agree to things, and then, like, when it comes time to do them... I used yeah, to do yeah. grant writing. I, I, can, I can do the writing of studies. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so let's hit, like two key takeaway points one for clinicians one for gamers from this particular journal one for clinicians let's let's take a look at how your uh patients are playing make sure you're doing a thorough postural analysis feel like the movement analysis portion of the uh, physical exam often gets missed See if they are falling into this upper cross syndrome classification. 
and then look for the tissue specific impairments associated with that and using this study to kind of guide you into uh, selectively uh, testing certain muscle groups that may be uh, overactive or underactive. Okay, and how about one takeaway for gamers? For gamers, I'm going to say your next posture is your best posture. Hey, nice. that's a good one to end it on. So um, this was Journal Club number two, where we looked at mobile gaming and how neck and back posture and hand are affected. Um, stay tuned for our next one, where Elliot talks more about really awesome research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.